Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Schmidt with LEAF, Wisconsin's K-12 Forestry Education Program. LEAF is part of the Wisconsin Center for Environmental Education and the College of Natural Resources at UWSP. LEAF is recording this presentation to post on the WCEE's YouTube channel for those who could not make it to the live event or for any of you educators who would like to share with multiple classes. In order to help assure enough bandwidth and the best quality of our recording, please keep yourself muted and video off. Thank you. For those of you less familiar with LEAF, our jobs are to connect you as educators with quality forestry education materials. Part of that job is to connect you with the resource professionals who are the experts. And that's one reason why we're here today. LEAF is a partnership between the Wisconsin DNR Division of Forestry and the Wisconsin Center of Envi Environmental Education. We have other LEAF staff here on the call as well. So if you would please introduce yourselves, that would be great. Hi, I'm Nicole Filizetti. Um, I'm with LEAF working mostly on professional development and um, with the Project Learning Trade Program. Hey everybody, I'm Gretchen Marshall, also with LEAF and my main focus is on the School Force Program for the state. Hi, I'm Jenny Christopher and I'm in charge of the communications. So um, please join our uh, monthly newsletter and our Facebook page that I'll put links to in the chat. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm one of the offices of support staff here. Thank you. Here's a more detailed list of our offerings and services. And if you'd like to find out more about them, um, you can visit our website, leafprogram.org for more information. During today's presentation, please feel free to put questions in the chat at any time. Some questions will be answered during the presentation. Uh, there'll be a few breaks and opportunities for that, and the rest will be responded to during the Q&A or via email, depending on time. With that, welcome to our speaker, Mike Hillstrom, Forest Health Specialist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the invite and thank you everybody for joining in today. And if you're joining in the future and watching this recorded, uh, thank you very much for checking it out. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's go here, share. All right. See my, Steve, uh, my screen okay, Steve? Yep. Perfect. All right, well, again, thank you everybody for being here. We're gonna talk about some invasive species today. So I just wanted to start with uh, some basic kind of what my job actually entails. So I am a forest health specialist for the Wisconsin DNR. And it's basically my job to uh, help residents, help foresters uh, be able to identify plants, trees, insects, diseases, weather events, um, all kinds of things that could potentially cause damage to forests. So uh, the job's really interesting in that sense and that no two years are ever alike. There's always something interesting going on. Uh, part of the job is to survey and map damage to forests. And so you can see a map over on the right here, and this is actually all of our damage from 2019 uh, that we mapped. And so you can see some pretty extensive areas. So these big red blobs are, are quite a bit of uh, blowdown that occurred with a big storm. And so it's interesting in that we do our surveys a bunch of different ways. So sometimes we're just driving around and, and kind of mapping what we see from a vehicle. Maybe we're out on a site visit and we map something. Uh, we do aerial surveys in planes, so we'll fly around and, and map damage that way. And then more and more, uh, we're even getting into using satellite data to be able to map damage. So uh, some interesting new stuff going on with that as well. Uh, one of the big pieces of my job is to help landowners determine the cause of what's damaging their forest and provide management advice. So, you know, uh, a landowner has, you know, let's say 20 acres of forest and they have some trees dying. They can call me up and say, hey, what's going on? I can come out and do a site visit, help them figure out what the issue is and, and what they can do about it to get their forest healthy again. And then of course, what we're talking about today, uh, invasive species. So big part of my job, of course, is, is to 
help people identify those invasive species and, and keep track of them and, and help manage them. So let's start at the beginning, since we're talking about forest health, what actually is a healthy forest? And so a healthy forest is, is a diverse group of native trees, you know, the associated understory plants, the wildlife, and a piece that, you know, we talk about a lot, but is maybe underappreciated a little bit are, are the soil communities. So those fungi and those microbes that make up the soil. Uh, the big piece of a healthy forest is in Wisconsin, what we talk about is sustainable management. And what that allows us to do is to create those, have those ecological services uh, that forests provide. So clean air, you know, clean water, habitat and food for wildlife. So those ecological services are obviously incredibly important and, and sustainable management helps us keep those. Also sustainable management helps us have economic benefits from forests and all the social benefits that we all like, the hiking, the biking, the camping, all that other fun stuff that we do. A healthy forest is better able to recover from, from disturbances. Uh, you know, maybe there's a big storm, maybe there's some sort of insect or disease outbreak and a healthy forest is, is better able to recover from those events. And also really important is that, you know, a healthy diverse forest is gonna be more adaptable to climate change, which is, you know, becoming a, a bigger issue. So we're here to talk about invasive species. So what is an invasive species and why are they so difficult to manage? So Wisconsin defines an invasive species as a non-indigenous species whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. And of course, most introductions of invasive species are caused by, hu by humans. Um, you know, especially in the modern world, global travel, global trade, uh, there's stuff moving all over the place. So there's always the threat of a new invasive species getting introduced. And why are invasive species so difficult to manage? Well, one of the main reasons is that you bring over this species and it doesn't come with its natural enemies, with its predators, um, you know, with something that eats it. And that's what would normally help keep that population in check. And when you don't have that, it can, it can expand much more rapidly. We do have a nat national strategy for dealing with invasive species. Of course, prevention is the first step. So um, if we can keep it from you know, coming into the country and, or the states and getting established, that's obviously what we would what we prefer. Um, but oftentimes, again, that's, that's just simply not possible. There's too many things moving around. And so that's where we get into early detection and rapid response. So at least we want to be able to detect that as soon as it shows up, whatever that is, an insect, a plant, uh, and, and deal with it as soon as possible. So it's, you know, the easiest to deal with. If we do get something that gets established, then we move into control and management. So, you know, what can we actually do to control that population? We'll talk a bunch about that today. And then ultimately we get into restoration. So how can we get that habitat that, that uh, you know has been disturbed in some way back to a healthy forest. All right, so let's launch into a few more specific topics here. So the first one I wanna talk about is gypsy moth. Uh, so gypsy moth is an invasive moth. It was introduced into the Eastern United States uh, all the way back in kind of the mid 1860s, 1869 to be exact. Uh, you can see a gypsy moth caterpillar, full grown one up in the upper right there. Um, and it spread slowly and, and made it to Wisconsin in about the 1970s. One of the big things with gypsy moth that makes it, uh, you know, such a pest, such an invasive species is that it can feed on over 300 different species of plants. So very, very diverse diet can eat all kinds of different things. You know, what do they actually do? Well, as you can see from the photo here, they defoliate the trees. So they, they eat all the leaves. Um, the good news in some sense is that even in a situation like this, the trees are often able to recover if they're healthy. So in this case, if I had showed you the same area three months later, all the trees leafed back out and they were fine. Where we have problems is if we get paired stressors. So 
if gypsy moth defoliates the same trees two, three, four years in a row, and the tree can't keep, you know, replenishing, that can become an issue. Or if gypsy moths, moth defoliates trees that have been stressed by drought or something like that, that's when we can start to see mortality. Um, and, and that's where the problem comes in. So where are gypsy moth populations at? Probably haven't heard much about gypsy moth in the past couple of years, and that's because populations were pretty low. So we did start to see a little bit of an increase in reports of caterpillars last year, uh, but we didn't really have much as def much defoliation. Um, what's interesting, though, is that Michigan mapped over 1 million acres or close to a million acres of trees that were defoliated last year. So that's obviously a massive area. Um, and so you know, we're, we're really watching out expecting that we'll probably see an increase in the gypsy moth population uh, in the coming years, uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So I want to talk a little bit about how we deal with invasive species. So one term that is really important is, is what's called integrated pest management. And what that means is, is we want to have as many tools to deal with an invasive species as possible. So we don't want to just use an insecticide. We want to see if we can use maybe uh, some sort of insecticide, maybe a biocontrol, uh, maybe we can you know do some sort of other management. So we want to be able to combine tools that uh, then kind of add up to the most effective management. And so with gypsy moth, uh, that starts with having a quarantine. And what that really means is if you look at the map on the right, the counties in red are quarantined for gypsy moth, the counties in the whites are not. And uh, in Wisconsin, what that means is that you cannot move firewood from a county in red that's quarantined to a county in white that's not quarantined. Um, and that's to keep from spreading, you know, gypsy moth to areas where it has not established yet. Uh, the second method that we use is there are traps that get placed out every year. Department of Agriculture puts out traps and they use that to determine uh, what they should do with their aerial spray program. And so it's interesting in that the product that they're actually spraying out of the airplanes when they spray is actually basically a soil bacterium. So it's kind of an interesting, it's a, it's a pesticide, but it's also just a soil bacterium. So it's a more, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a better way of going about things. It's a good tool to have. We actually also have a number of biocontrol agents for gypsy moth. Uh, so there are both a fungi, uh, a fungus and a virus and uh, also some wasps that attack gypsy moth. So if you look at the picture in the left, I know it's a little hard to see, um, but you can see this gypsy moth caterpillar is dead and hanging straight down. That one was killed by a fungus that attacks gypsy moth. And then these two are kind of in Vs, and so V virus. So if you ever see dead caterpillars, gypsy moth caterpillars like that, um, those were killed by the virus actually. So in Wisconsin anyways, those have been really useful um, as far as keeping gypsy moth populations in check. So we'll, we'll see how they do in the coming years. And then one really important piece of, of dealing with any invasive species is, is really the education and the outreach about it. So we've done a ton of education uh, with gypsy moth about not moving firewood because uh, you don't want to risk moving the egg masses around, um, you know, and, and just informing people of other aspects. So, you know, what is it about the aerial, how does the aerial spray program work or how can people deal with gypsy moth caterpillars on their yard trees? Uh, so lots of effort goes into that as well. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next insect here. Uh, probably another one most people have, have heard of, um, been in the news a lot over the last 10 years. Uh, and that's emerald ash borer. Uh, emerald ash borer is an invasive wood boring beetle. It arrived in Michigan. Uh, it was first discovered in 2002. It was probably there for, for years before that, before it was actually discovered. Uh, and it's believed it came over, uh, basically hatched out of wood packing crates that were shipped from Asia. It made its way from the Detroit area over to Wisconsin in 2008 is when we first found it. 
And the big concern with Emerald Ash Borer is that it attacks ash trees and kills more than 99% of them. So you can see a forest uh, over here where there is widespread mortality of the ash trees. Uh, this is over in southeastern Wisconsin where you know the populations kind of started first, the biggest populations of emerald ash borer. Uh, we have over 700 million ash trees in Wisconsin, about 7% of the forest. So that is a major concern to potentially be losing all those trees. And on top of that, ash was planted uh, as a major urban street tree. So we have that concern of well of the of the cost and, and the hazards of dealing with urban ash trees as well. So let's talk a little bit more about the insect itself. You can see in the bottom left, uh, we have the adult beetles from kind of three different angles. So about a half inch long when they're uh, when they're adults and this nice bright metallic green color. There are some other metallic green insects in Wisconsin, so there are some things you can confuse it with, uh, but the general shape and the fact that it's associated with ash trees, um, only ash trees uh, should, should kind of help with the identification. If you were to peel back the bark of an infested tree, you would see these larvae, they get to be about an inch long and have these very characteristic kind of bell-shaped uh, curves to them. That's one good way to identify the larvae. And the larvae are actually the damaging life stage. Uh, so the adults lay eggs on the bark, uh, the larvae hatch, go into the tree, and they create these S-shaped galleries you can see here. And the reason that's an issue is as you get more and more of those galleries, those are in the water and nutrient conducting tissue of the tree. And so over time, the tree basically just can't move water anymore and that causes it to die. Where has ash, emerald ash borer been found in the States? Uh, it's pretty widespread at this point across the whole Southern half of the States. So you can see southern third, uh, it's pretty much everywhere at this point. It's heavier infestation in some areas than others, but it's um, it can be found almost anywhere. As you move into the more central part of the state, you can see you know it gets a little more scattered. It's more widespread in that area. Um, we're actively mapping and, and kind of finding new infestations throughout the central part of the state. The northern part of the state, there's still lots of areas where emerald ash borer hasn't been found. And so that's, you know, we want to keep it that way as long as possible, give us give ourselves the longest time frame to kind of do that necessary management, uh, which we will talk about in just a second here. So management options. So again, let's talk about, you know, what, what are our tools of integrated pest management here? So of course, again, uh, initially we set up a quarantine, meaning, uh, you know, ash trees weren't allowed to be moved in or out of the state. And then as emerald ash borer was found in counties, uh, it was restricted movement of like firewood from county to county. Uh, all that is kind of coming to an end now. The federal quarantine that restricted movement from state to state ended in January of this year. And we will be ending our kind of state level rules over the next couple of years here. And that's just because it's it's so widespread in the state at this point that having that quarantine just isn't effective anymore. Uh, we do have some great tools for dealing with Emerald Ash Borer. And we're hoping that over time, these tools will help us to you know get the population down and, and hopefully help us get ash back on the landscape again, or keep ash on the landscape tree resistance programs are, are one big piece of that. And so if you were to go over to Asia where emerald ash borer is native to, uh, the trees are, are tolerant of, of the damage of emerald ash borer. So you can find emerald ash borer infesting the trees, but they don't kill those trees. So the question becomes, what is it about those trees that allows them to survive attack by emerald ash borer? And can we find a way to get our trees in Wisconsin, in you know North America, to be able to protect themselves against emerald ash borer? So a lot of research going into that area, and and you know there's been some good progress on it. So hopefully in the not too distant future, um, we'll we'll hopefully have some ash trees um, that are resistant to emerald ash borer. Biocontrol is the major part of, of what we're doing with emerald ash borer currently. So there are a few different species of tiny stingless wasps. Um, they could literally fly into you and you'd never even notice. They're you know of no harm to people or pets or anything. So uh, the two on the right here 
actually attack the larvae of emerald ash borer and then the tiny ones actually go after the eggs. Uh, so, you know, these have been shown to be pretty effective uh, at reducing emerald ash borer populations. They're never going to get rid of the population entirely, um, but they're one really good way to reduce the population. Uh, and you can see from the picture over on the right here, um, this is an example of when we go out and, and release the wasps, what that looks like. So we'll find a site where the ash are kind of just starting to die from emerald ash borer. Uh, sometimes those wasps come as adults and we release them as adults. Sometimes they come as kind of pupae in these, uh, in these little segments of wood. And then there's a few other ways as well. So kind of interesting to, to go out. Um, often these sites can be a little wet, uh, you know, nice and mosquito infested and everything else. So, um, you know, always a fun, interesting experience. Uh, insecticides, let's talk about those for just a second. So insecticides are not something we're generally using for emerald ash borer in the forest. Um, it's really more of an urban tool. Uh, so in an urban landscape where you have really high value trees, so if you have a nice big ash tree over your house, uh, insecticides can be an effective way to, to keep that tree alive, um, but not a tool we're going to generally use, too, just too expensive and would be too difficult to employ out, out in the forest. And then lastly, uh, kind of the biggest piece um, of what you know DNR forestry deals with is, is just from a forest management perspective. And so we have this entire uh, book, I think it's 60 plus pages, something like that, uh, our Emerald Ash Forest Silviculture Guidelines. So if you go to the DNR webpage and search forest health or just, you know, search in Google or whatever for Emerald Ash for Civil Culture Guidelines, um, you will find that document. If you want to know everything and anything and everything about Emerald Ash Borer and how to manage forest stands, lots and lots of good information in there. Definitely encourage you to, to check it out. All right, one more insect and then I will pause before we move on to the diseases. So uh, Asian longhorn beetle. So this is actually an invasive that has not been found in Wisconsin, uh, but it keeps popping up in new places. And so it's one we're constantly on the watch for. Uh, so you can see on the top, this is an Asian longhorn beetle. So big, you're talking two inches, a uh, big black shiny beetle with long antennae. But we do have some native Sawyer beetles that, that look kind of similar. And so we regularly get pictures of people concerned that they see the Sawyer beetle and think it might be Asian longhorn beetle. Um, if, if you ever want to try to identify yourself, uh, the key is if it has this little white spot at the top of the wing covers, then that's one of our native uh, longhorn beetles and, and you don't need to worry about it. Um, but if you're not sure, always a good idea um, to get in touch with uh, somebody, uh, myself or somebody else in forest health. Uh, if you can grab the beetle or if you can take a photo, you know, send it our way and we're more than happy to, you know, confirm for you uh, if it's something invasive or something native. Uh, so where is Asian longhorn beetle at the moment? Uh, there's been a, an ongoing infestation up in Massachusetts for, for many, many years. Uh, they're slowly getting control of it, um, but still working on that one. Uh, New Jersey, um, pretty small infestation. Again, another one they've been working on in the New York, New Jersey area for many years and, and slowly getting control of that one as well. Ohio, uh, again, um, they've made some progress on, on you know, kind of reducing that infestation, um, but still actively working on it in, in Southwest Ohio there. And then just last year, uh, late in the year, uh, it was discovered in South Carolina. Uh, pretty big infestation, uh, pretty widespread and in some difficult difficult areas to access. So that one will be interesting. Uh, a lot of resources going at it to, to try and do it. Uh, one, of the, one of the good things with Asian longhorn beetle is it has a pretty slow life cycle. Um, and so it is a full eradication program where they have had success of actually eradicating populations. As an example, there was an infestation of Asian longhorn beetle in Illinois, in the Chicago area, and they were actually able to eradicate that. So, um, you know, this is one species where, you know, we, we really can actually make progress and, and have a big impact. Okay, so what's the concern with Asian longhorn beetle? Why are we actually concerned about it? Well, the biggest reason is one of its primary host species is maple. 
and obviously we have a lot of maple in Wisconsin and it's a you know a major tree species so it would be a major concern if, if it came in if Asian longhorn beetle came in and, and started killing maples in, in Wisconsin it does also attack a bunch of other species um, that we have in the state so you know also concern from that perspective as well uh, this insect tends to be pretty obvious uh, you know, like I said, it's a two inch long, big, big, shiny insect. So people tend to notice it. Um, but even if you just look at the trees, they have these big half inch diameter exit holes, almost dime sized. And oftentimes there's a lot of sawdust kicked out of those exit holes. So um, you might notice that. And the other interesting thing is they chew these little pits to lay eggs in. So those can be pretty noticeable on, on infested trees as well. Uh, as far as the adults, you would really notice those from July through September. And there's some evidence in the Northeast that they uh, tend to wash up in pool filters occasionally as well. So, you know, it might happen. Okay, before I move on to oak wilt, I'm just going to pause for a second here and see if there were any questions I should answer. I have a question, Mike, sure. in, unless you're going to have a section on this later. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of research happens on the biocontrols to make sure that they're not going to become their own problem in the future? Excellent question. Yes. So, um, you know, decades ago, biocontrol was a very different thing. Um, you know, we'd go potentially go to where the insect was from or whatever and, and find something that was eating it and, and let it go and see what happened. Um, and, and, you know, we had some issues because of that. So we, we learned our lesson. So now, uh, nowadays, uh, it's probably minimum five, oftentimes six or seven years of research and literally millions of dollars that go into making sure that any biocontrol agent we're going to release is very specific to the insect we're targeting. So those uh, wasps that go after emerald ash borer, um, you know, they have a very narrow host range. They're not going to go out and start attacking, you know, a bunch of other insects or anything like that. So uh, yeah, there's a lot more effort that goes into to making sure they're targeting the correct insect and we're not going to, you know, do more harm than harm than good, basically. Great question. Thanks. Okay. Let's jump into oak wilt in that case. So oak wilt is a fungal disease of oak trees and it is most severe in red oak. So red oaks are the ones that have the pointy tips on the leaves. Uh, if it was white oak, white oaks have more rounded tips. So in this case, we're more concerned about the red oaks, although uh, white oaks like bur oak can get oak wilt, um, generally not as big of an issue. Oak wilt was first found in Wisconsin in 1944. It's really unknown how it got here. Um, Wisconsin was basically the first place in the entire United States it showed up and we really have no idea how it got here and probably will never know. So. Um, you know, sometimes we just don't know how these things show up. Uh, the problem with oak wilt is basically once a tree is uh, infected with oak wilt, the fungus grows through the water conducting tissue and that causes those infected trees to wilt and die. The most common symptoms we see, uh, how you would identify that it's likely oak wilt are leaf bronzing and rapid leaf drop from July to October. So if you look over at the uh, photo on the right, you can see, you know, there's kind of a tree that that's probably died last year. This is a photo I actually took last summer. So this tree probably died, uh, you know, late in 2019. And then this was in, I think June or uh, this was probably July of 2020. Um, you can see here that there's a tree that's actively wilting. You can see it's wilting, it starts at the top and the wilting works its way down. And you can see all those leaves on the ground that have fallen off the tree. So those are classic signs of oak wilt. If you look at the leaves more carefully, they often have these kind of patches of green still on them. And then that kind of bronzy or kind of brown water soaked appearance. So those are all classic signs of, of oak wilt. And then from there, we, we do have some lab tests we can do to officially confirm if it is oak, the oak wilt fungus in, infecting a tree. 
So new infections of oak wilt occur when sap beetles spread fungal spores to a wounded oak. So basically what happens is let's pretend uh, that this tree here is, uh, you know, died of oak wilt in 2020. Let's say it died of oak wilt in September of 2020. Uh, right about now, um, in the, over the next month or so here, that tree will pretty, be producing a fungal mat. So this is kind of what a fungal mat looks like. And so it produces this fungal mat that has all the spores of the fungus in it. And what happens is, is these little beetles can, can smell that. They come in, they feed in there, they get the spores all over them, and then they go off looking for another food source. And so as the name implies, sap beetles um, they're looking for a meal of sap or something similar. And so if we get storm damage or, uh, you know, a tree gets pruned or something like that, those beetles can go feed on that wound and thereby kind of start a new oak wilt infection when those spores get onto that, that, new, that new host. Once the fungus is in a tree, it then grows into the root tissue or spreads into the root tissue and uh, can go from tree to tree. So red oaks often, the roots often connect from tree to tree. And so the fungus can basically just keep growing from tree to tree to tree. Uh, and that's how you get these kind of expanding pockets of mortality. So what do we do about oak wilt? Well, one of the primary things we talk about is uh, no cutting in oak stands from April to, April to July. Uh, same thing with pruning. So we know that those spore mats that we just talked about are most abundant in that window, in that time period, and that the beetle populations often are highest in that time period as well. So when we know those two things are together, uh, that's when we uh, recommend no cutting of oaks or no pruning of oaks. There's a little bit of risk later in the season um, but it's much, much, much lower than, than uh, you know, earlier in the year. So, um, you know, if you want to take a no-risk approach, you, you know, you should only prune your oak trees maybe outside of the growing season. Um, but the risk is much, much lower even once you get, you know, kind of past July. Okay, a couple of tools I just wanted to mention. One, uh, we have this brand new uh, oak wilt vectors tool that just came out. So if you wanna know when the beetles are gonna start emerging in the spring, you can type in your latitude and your longitude. And this tool calculates degree days. Um, and it figures out basically when those beetles are gonna start emerging. So rather than saying, you know, well, they usually come out about April 1st in the southern part of the state. Okay, well, that's great. But if we have a really early spring like we did this year, you know, is there concern that they might be out in March already? Well, this tool we can use to help us figure that out, whether they might be out early or a little later or kind of when the, when the highest risk is. And then similar to Emerald Ash Borer, we also have a whole document with uh, guidelines for, for forest stands of how to kind of deal with uh, reducing the risk of, of spreading oak wilt. So again, if it's something you're interested in, go to our websites, um, go to our Forest Health website and, and check that out. Where is oak wilt in the States? Uh, it's pretty widespread at this point. So any of these counties in red, we consider generally infested, meaning that you could find oak wilt anywhere in the county. It doesn't mean it's everywhere in the county, it just means you could find it anywhere. Uh, in some of these other counties where the, the township's colored in in pink, those are areas where we found oak wilt, um, but it's not widely established in the county yet. Um, so there's still a fair amount of area in Northern Wisconsin where, where there isn't any oak wilt yet. And, and obviously we wanna keep it that way for as, as long as possible. All right, oak wilt management. Uh, do we have tools for dealing with oak wilt? Yes, we do have some tools. It can be pretty tricky to deal with. Again, once you have a fungus in a root system, um, pretty difficult to access that. Uh, so the kind of tried and true method is uh, root severing. And so, you know, basically what happens is come in with a big piece of heavy equipment and try to cut roots between the infected trees and the healthy trees and stop that fungus from spreading below ground. You can do a similar thing by extracting stumps. 
And then we have some uh, research that we've been funding and some others have been working on looking at some new tools that are using herbicide to try and kill off root systems and try to stop the spread that way. So a few tools in the toolbox and we're, we're continually trying to come up with new methods. Okay, I'm gonna pause for just a second here before we move into invasive plants. Okay, so invasive plants, um, you know, a whole nother category invasives to deal with. Uh, what's the concern? Uh, one of the biggest concerns is that they reduce the diversity of native species. So oftentimes, if you go into a stand that has, you know, a lot of buckthorn, it's the only thing in the understory is buckthorn. Uh, there's not all the native bushes and flowers and, you know, forbs and everything else that would normally be in there. So that's one major concern. Uh, from a forestry perspective, one of the major things we're concerned about is, again, if you have a whole bunch of an invasive plant in the understory, oftentimes that's preventing tree seedlings from, uh, from you know, starting up, from regenerating. And so that's a major concern for us as well. And then also, you know, as you get an invasive in a stand, oftentimes they kind of promote other invasives moving in as well. So oftentimes, once you get one or two, you start seeing more and more kind of moving into a system so they can kind of uh, facilitate each other. So what do we do about invasive plants in Wisconsin? How do we manage them? Um, it starts again with kind of that rule making process. And so for Wisconsin, that rule is called NR40. And what it says is that it's illegal to possess, transport, transfer, or introduce certain invasive species. And so there's a whole list of, of invasive species. Um, and again, if you're interested, uh, lots of information on our Forest Health website, you can definitely check that out. Um, and then the other big set of tools we want to provide are best management practices that help minimize spread. So what, what can we do to actually stop movement? And so one really uh, nice program that Minnesota started and uh, is kind of spreading out to other states is called Play Clean Go. And so it's, it's a great rule, a great set of tools, kind of education and outreach tools that talk about, you know, removing plants, um, for, uh, and mud from your, you know, your boots when you're out in the woods, you know, cleaning gear, um, you know, lots of other stuff like that, certified firewood. So uh, you'll be hearing more and more about this program over the, over the coming years. Let's just talk real quick about a couple of the most common invasive plants. So uh, buckthorn is definitely one of the, if not the most common invasive. Um, there's some others that are pretty common as well, of course, but in a forestry setting, buckthorn is, is really common. Um, there's two species, common and glossy, that we deal with. They are tall understory shrubs or small trees. They have this gray to kind of brown bark, and they have these really prominent what are called lenticels, these kind of light colored patches. Uh, you have to be a little careful because cherry have, have those as well. So they can be confused with cherry trees. Uh, if you were to get into kind of beneath the bark, you would see this kind of yellow orange inner bark. And if you look down on the bottom here, this is what the leaves look like. Uh, so, you know, kind of ovate to elliptical um, and have these really prominent veins in both species. So um, that can make it pretty obvious what it is. Um, and then uh, round pea-sized, uh, either red or black fruit. So you can see the fruit over on the, on the right side here. Honeysuckle is another um, very common group. And so I'm just gonna call them the bush honeysuckles. There's a uh, four or five probably more different species within that group but uh, from a management perspective uh, we treat them all the same basically so there are actually native honeysuckle vines as well so those we're not concerned about we're just concerned about these invasive bush honeysuckles uh, multi-stem shrubs you can kind of get a an image here of you know that multi-stem nature that they have. Uh, you can see the leaves, uh, elliptical to oblong, a little bit hairy. Uh, in the very near future, they'll be putting out these very fragrance, uh, very nice smelling actually, uh, you know, white or pink flowers. Um, and then also they have these kind of red, orange or yellow paired fruits. So those are the key characteristics to identify those bush honeysuckles. 
One of the species of biggest concern to us in a forestry setting is Japanese barberry. Uh, it is a low growing shrub, two, three feet tall. I've seen them even a little bit taller than that maybe. Uh, and you can see these nice spines they have on the uh, branch nodes. And so you get a big patch of, of barberry. It is not a fun thing to walk through. It'll, it'll tear you up pretty good. Um, the leaves are really interesting. They're kind of this spatula shape um, or oval shape to them. So that's usually pretty obvious in identifying barberry. Uh, the berries can be very obvious when the berries are out. And, and as you can see, they can hang on well into winter. Um, but the big concern with barberry is because of its kind of low growing nature, the thorns, it's really good habitat for things like white footed mice and other rodents that uh, tend to carry a lot of the ticks. Uh, that are an important part of the of the Lyme disease life cycle as well. So there's concerns where we get, you know, more and more barberry that we're going to have more and more problems with ticks and things like Lyme disease. So definitely a species we always promote uh, landowners, uh, you know, getting rid of. Last plant I'm going to talk about is garlic mustard. Uh, so garlic mustard, uh, it's an herbaceous biennial. What that means is, you know, first year produces this kind of rosette. Um, and then second year, it actually bolts, meaning it grows up much taller and it produces these kind of four petaled white flowers. Ultimately, it produces these seed pods um, and that's how it, how it spreads. And as the name implies, garlic mustard, if you kind of take the leaves and crinkle them up in your hands, it has a very strong garlic smell. So pretty easy to identify uh, garlic mustard. Management, I'm not gonna dive into the details. If you wanna know uh, the details for any invasive plant of how can I get rid of it, uh, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network is a, has a great uh, database with control methods, uh, all kinds of details. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Um, but in general, we, we have a variety of ways to deal with invasive plants. So uh, things like barberry, they're very shallow rooted. It's honestly very easy to pull them out by hand. So if you just have a few plants, you know, you can literally just pull them out by hand. Uh, mowing is a common practice. So if you get a, a, you know, a nice wall of buckthorn or honeysuckle, often the first step we need to take is, is to go through there with a, you know, with a forestry kind of mower, go through there, mow it down. That is not alone going to kill it. It'll re-sprout. And then that's when we often go back in and use a herbicide of some variety and, and kind of hit it a second time. So oftentimes with invasive plant management, we have to use uh, more than one tool, kind of as we talked about with you know integrated pest management earlier. Uh, we do have biological control methods. So um, you know, grazing is a is a tool that's becoming more popular. Uh, so, you know, sending a, a herd of goats in there to eat the invasives. Uh, you always have to be a little careful, um, you know, if those goats, uh, you know, eat a bunch of seeds and then go to a different site, um, they could spread the invasive plant that way potentially. And if you, you know, leave them on a site for too long, you could potentially compact the soil. So you got to be a little careful when you're using grazing, but it is a, a, a great tool as well. So. Um, and then, of course, uh, similar to what we talked about with some of the insects, there are actually insects and fungi that attack uh, some of the invasive plants. And so there's some programs to, to utilize those insects or those fungi to help reduce populations of invasive plants as well. Uh, prescribed fire, um, definitely a tool that can be used. It, it works well for some invasive plants. Uh, it does not work at all for others. So again, you kind of need to know what plant you're dealing with and, and you know, look into it in more detail. All right, the last kind of uh, topic I'll cover here before we move into a little bit other material are worms. So worms, uh, we do not have any native worms in Wisconsin. So all the worms that you see anywhere are invasive species. Any native worms we had were wiped out during the last glacial period 10,000 plus years ago. So we now have at least 20 species of invasive worms in Wisconsin uh, introduced from either Europe or from Asia. Uh, some of those were just, you know, introduced by accident, um, but some were introduced, you know, on purpose for farming or for fishing. 
Um, so what's the problem with worms? You've probably been hearing your whole life, worms are great, right? Well, they're, they're fine for your garden. Um, you know, where you're growing a plant that's growing really rapidly, you know, you're growing a tomato plant or something like that. It's going to grow for a couple of months, produce food, and, and then it's going to be done. That kind of nutrient turnover in the soil that worms do is, is fine. Um, but in a forest, that's a very different system. You know, trees are much longer lived and what we really want is a nice thick layer of leaves and debris on the ground. Um, we want that slow breakdown of those leaves over time. That's really good, um, you know, kind of material for, for tree seedlings to get started in. So worms, they take all that material and they kind of eat it. Um, and so it makes it harder to establish tree seedlings and, and, and can cause some other issues we'll discuss in a second here. So how do you know if you have worms in your forest? A uh, couple ways, um, you'll often see these middens, which are basically worm poop around the openings to their burrows. And you'll also oftentimes see where there's partially eaten leaves, kind of stems sticking right out of, of their burrows. Uh, as we just kind of discussed, a lot of times where worms invade, you have high worm populations, you'll see bare soil. So they've literally taken all those leaves that were sitting on the ground and, and eaten them all. And uh, one of the big concerns is that when they do that and disturb the soil like that, is that makes great pathway for invasive plants to move in. So you'll often see uh, worms and invasive plants sort of working hand in hand. So what do we do about worms? Well, you know, the big goal is, is to try to keep them from spreading. So prevention, like we've talked about for everything else, uh, there's really no way we have currently of removing worms from the soil. Uh, once they're in an area, we are working and, and um, you know, doing some research, working with some partners on finding ways to control worms. Um, so hopefully we have those tools in the future. Uh, but the thing, big thing right now is there's still plenty of parts of the state that actually don't have any earthworms. And so we want to keep it that way as long as possible in, in the forests anyways. What can you do to help? Uh, don't release live baits. So if you go fishing and take some worms with you, you know, don't just dump those back in the water or on the land, dispose of them in the trash. And if you're somebody who's into using worms in your, you know, kind of for composting purposes, keep those contained. Uh, don't let them escape out, out into, you know, native landscapes. And then as we talked about with invasive plants, another really important thing is, is to wash your shoes or, you know, clean off tire treads. So if you go for a hike in the woods, um, you know, and you got a bunch of mud caked on your boots, you know, wipe that off before you, before you leave the site. Or if you get, you're out on your ATV or something like that, you know, knock the mud off the tires before you take it to a new site. Uh, worms actually reproduce by producing little cocoons. And so you can move those cocoons around uh, that are in the soil if, if, you know, there's a bunch of mud stuck. Oh, and I wanted to mention real quick, um, we do have, uh, there's a very interesting uh, little science project if you wanna check out uh, through LEAF where you get mustard powder and you mix it with water. And if you dump that on the soil, it irritates the worm skin. And so they'll come out of the ground basically. So if you ever wanna make a nice mustard water soupy mess and check out what worms are in an area, uh, Leaf has a cool project written up for, for how to do that. And that leads me into forest health kits. If you are interested, uh, there are forest health kits available through to check out through Leaf. Uh, they have nets and identification books and uh, examples of things like Emerald Dashboard and all kinds of fun stuff in there. So uh, if it's something you're interested in using for your class, um, definitely check those out. All right, Forest Health website. So I've referred to our Forest Health website a bunch of times. What does it actually look like? So here's a picture of what our website actually looks like. If you just go to dnr.wisconsin.gov. Um, and search Forest Health, you'll find our website. Uh, if you're interested in signing up for our newsletter, absolutely feel free to do that. We have a bunch of fact sheets that talk about all the things I've talked about today. And then as you can see, I've, you know, all, all the topics that we've covered today are, are prominently featured on our website with lots of useful information. Okay, I want to talk about careers for just a second here. So I talked a little bit about my job at the at the beginning. So let's just talk a little bit more about careers real quick. Um, so 
there are lots of ways to be involved in forest health. Uh, you could be an entomologist, be working on the insect side of things. You could be a pathologist working on, you know, kind of the fungal end of things or something like that. Um, foresters are obviously very involved in forest health. You have botanists working on invasive plants, you know, conservation biologists, all kinds of other things. So there's lots of ways to be involved in, in forest health. So just kind of keep that in mind. The jobs range really widely from, you know, high school diploma all the way up to getting your doctorate degree. Um, and, and there's a diversity of jobs as well as far as you might be running around in the woods or, or if you aren't into getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and ticks, maybe you want to be a lab person. So there's those jobs as well. Um, you know, there's lots of opportunities out there. There's jobs available in every state and all over the world in forest health, uh, government jobs. You could be a university researcher or teacher. Um, we mentioned outreach and education a lot of times. Those are really critical jobs. Um, and also, uh, as Brian Wall mentioned in the urban forestry talk, the last session, there's also jobs, you know, doing arborist work and all kinds of other things. So a really broad range of, of, of different ways. And then I just wanted to mention that um, the technology aspect of forest health has is, is really come a long way as well. So, uh, you know, our whole group, when we're out in the woods, we have a smartphone, we have a tablet, we're out there collecting and mapping data, you know, on our, on our smartphones or on our tablets, um, you know, doing kind of GIS work. So that's becoming an increasingly big piece of what we do. And then also uh, using modern molecular tools. So, um, you know, looking, uh, getting wood samples and trying to detect the DNA of the fungus in the wood sample or whatever it is. So uh, that's also coming a long way. So uh, very interesting kind of modern way of doing forest health. All right, just a couple more slides here real quick. I just wanted to mention if you know you want to kind of test the waters or you just want to do something on your free time related to forest health, there are programs such as the Wisconsin First Detector Network. Uh, so they're starting up a spotted, lan spotted lanternfly, which is a relatively new invasive species. Um, program. You could think about that. There are groups that, you know, deal with getting rid of invasive plants. So kind of watch for those opportunities if you're interested. And then importantly, June is Invasive Species Action Month. So now is a really great time to think about, you know, how you can help with invasive species in Wisconsin. Maybe that's removing an invasive species on your forested land. Maybe that's posting about how to deal with it on, you know, your social media, whatever that is. So keep that in mind and, and plan something for June. And with that, I have seen what looks like a bunch of questions, I think, coming in. So I am done and I am happy to answer any questions anyone has. Chat. All right. Just, what do we got? Just reminding uh, everybody that they can be putting um, their questions in the chat. And Mike, if you could unshare your screen, I will. Uh, give people a little bit of time to do that and share my screen again. Perfect. So um, this is the final speaker in this series, but stay connected to LEAF for the possibility of more of these DNR guest expert presentations next year. Uh, we're hoping to put some together. In addition, we hope to start in-person PD in the summer um, or fall. In the meantime, we have online courses, including a new one being launched soon, the uh, teaching about careers in the forest. Um, we're also working to put together an invasive species workshop for educators, but the timing of that will partly depend on COVID restrictions um, because we, we hope that will be an in-person workshop. Um, so possibly summer or fall depending on DNR and university regulations um, at the moment um, when we like to plan that. So um, I'm not seeing the chat right now, but if Nicole or Jacob, if you have any questions that came up in the chat, if you wanna share those with Mike, that would be great. Unless yeah, Mike... so, oh, sorry, Steve. Um, a lot of the chat comments were links to things, the worm watch lesson um, and some other resources related to that. So if you're interested in that, um, folks, go check out the chat and you can find PDFs 
um, and links to some of those things that, uh, some of the resources that Mike mentioned. Um, but no direct questions were typed in the chat. So um, I'm gonna encourage folks to go ahead. If you do have a question, feel free. Um, you can unmute yourself um, and either just speak up or raise your hand if uh, folks in the audience do have any questions. And if you don't feel like asking now, or if it's somebody watching this in the future, um, my you know email and phone number are all readily available on the DNR website, um, on that Forest Health website. Feel free to call, text, email. Uh, you know, I, I'm always happy to help out. So definitely, if you have something down the road or now, let me know. Mike, I have a question um, related to firewood transport. I know on the Gypsy Moth slide, you were talking about how you can't take firewood from a gypsy moth infested county to a, a county that doesn't have gypsy moths. Um, is there, there's still the 50 mile rule though, isn't there where you can't transport firewood anywhere in the state more than 50 miles to prevent like emerald ash borer and those other, or is that not a state rule? So there, there's a 10 mile rule for state parks. So you can't bring firewood for more than 10 miles into a state park. Um, so yes, that is still intact. Um, there's not a, just a general rule from county to county, but there is that specific rule for the for the state parks still. So yeah, we're definitely encouraging, you know, if you're going camping for the weekend, get wood locally. Uh, the other side of that is, you know, a lot of gas stations or dealers have certified firewood, which means it's been heat treated or aged to kind of certify it doesn't have uh, you know, insects or diseases in it. And I, I see a question down in the chat about how are Japanese long, or how are uh, the Asian longhorn beetles transported or moved? And, uh, and honestly, you know, probably one of the biggest ways is, is, is firewood moving around. So same kind of idea, if you can buy certified firewood, that that's really a, a great way to go. Then in, we're, you know, pretty sure it doesn't have anything. Uh, oak welts can move in you know, firewood. So lots of things can get moved around in firewood. So it's a really important thing to, you know, buy it locally and, and not move it around. Thanks. Um, I have another question, as long as we've sure. got a lot. Um, <laughs> is there, and maybe this is you, but are, are there any current um, DNR research projects going on um, for instance, one that came to mind was, you know, are we actively researching whether or not the white-footed mouse populations go up in barberry areas, or is that research that's happening elsewhere that we just know that that happens? Because I thought that would be a great student project. Um, I can think of some places that I know of that just are barberry thickets. Yes, there are some barberry thickets in the central sands for sure. Um, uh, we do not have anything actively going on at, at the moment as far as that. There have been some research studies that have that have kind of linked those things. Um, it's something we've been discussing. So there's the relatively new infectious disease center. I forget exactly what the title is uh, through the entomology program at UW-Madison. Um, and so they have some researchers that are working on ticks and mosquitoes and stuff like that. So it's been a discussion point. Um, we haven't gotten to the point of kind of funding and getting something off the ground. So um, there are some researchers out in the East Coast looking at it, but it's definitely a, a hot topic and something we'd like to, to do, you know, more research on. So I, I'd say probably going to happen sometime in the next couple of years, hopefully, um, actively discussing it. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Mike, this is Gretchen. I have a quick question for you. Sure. Uh, a few years ago, um, we really heavily promoted the Great Lakes first or early detectors network. Um, is that still in existence? And um, is that another opportunity for schools to get involved and reporting the invasive species they see on their lands? Yeah, um, it's it's still it's still active. Um, we've reached this point now between kind of uh, Ed Ed Maps and and Great Lakes, and there's a few other things, and so it's it's become a a bit of a tricky thing to tell people, oh, go and report things on this website or go promote things on that website because now there's you know multiple websites and okay, uh, so it's so, grown. Yeah, so there's a okay. there's an active effort. 
uh, very active effort right now to sort of figure out what direction those things are going to go in and kind of what tool we want to use going forward. Um, of course, that's the other thing with technology. As soon as you set something up two years later, it's out of date and you have to <laughs> kind of reassess. So uh, I take another one where I'd say in the next year here, um, we'll have uh, we'll probably be doing some more kind of social media and stuff related to uh, the tools that we want to use going forward. Got it. Thanks. We just, after multiple years, rehired our forest kind of invasive plant coordinator position. And uh, Mary Barkowiak is, is who's in charge of that, uh, who moved into that position now. Um, and so she will, she's kind of spearheading that whole effort. Um, so we'll be talking a lot more about it. Well, thanks, Mike. If there are no other questions, um, we will try to have this video posted uh, sometime early next week. And um, one last call for questions. Just wanted to say before we log off, thanks again to, to Leaf for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. I really appreciate it. And thanks for everybody who, who chimed in. And yeah, looking, looking forward to continuing to you know, kind of work together in the future. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Mike. It was really good information. Again, as always, I really liked how you hit on each species and, and really um, plant, animal, disease, fungus, um, to, to really break it down and make it easy to understand. Because I think some of them get very, very confused with each other. <laughs> Absolutely. We, why do we have to call everything Asian whatever beetle? <laughs> I, I, we even get confused sometimes. So. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon, and uh, we hope to touch base with you soon. Take care.